someone knows where we are. <laughs> this morning's second reading is from Matthew 24, verses 36 through 44. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the wheel, one will be taken and one will be left. Watch therefore, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, if the householder had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of God is coming at the hour we do not expect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. We've had a week of giving thanks, of celebrating with family and friends. And we come to you this morning still with that thankfulness in our hearts. And we seek your word. So this morning, Lord, I ask that either because of me or in spite of me, that you bring a message to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah, I don't know about you. But it is beginning to look a whole lot like Christmas. <laughs> Going downstairs and seeing the mangers being made by the, the children and all laid out and uh, being able to participate this past week in the, in the Goodwill Thanksgiving dinner as well as the Kennedy Krieger Festival of Trees and decorating the trees. It is beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And as soon as the radio started playing Christmas music, I was instructed by my daughter that we are to listen to that Christmas music as long as they continue to play it. So it's even beginning to sound a lot like Christmas, but it's even more than that, isn't it? We feel it, we hear it, we see it, we even smell it in places, the pine and the cinnamon and all those different things. I love Christmas. And those are just some of the reasons why. Today we enter into Advent as a time of preparation for what has been, is, and will be again. We prepare for the coming of the Christ child, the, the child that brought about peace, the child that was Emmanuel, God with us. Christmas is that time of peace. You feel it. You may not understand it, but you feel it. And it just touches the hearts of everyone around. Some of the things that help us to understand that are the stories of Christmas. How many of you just love the stories of Christmas time? Love sharing them, love hearing them. Stories that remind us of the looks, smells, and feelings of Christmas. The story of St. Nicholas. Uh, true saints for which we get Santa Claus and all of those stories from there, the, the kindly saint who shared of what he had and did it in secret uh, rather than out in the open. The story of a Christmas carol by Charles Dickens, the story of redemption of Scrooge, of the him discovering the things from his past and his present and also looking into the future and having that change him into the better version of himself that God had in store for him all along. 
And one of my favorite uh, carol hymns, or, yeah, I don't know if it's a hymn. One of my favorite Christmas songs <laughs> is Little Drummer Boy. And I love the, the story of that too. You know, I don't have anything else to bring, but I can play my drum for you. These are just great stories. And when you hear about the stories, how many of you have the song or the story running through your head already? Stories are amazing things. Stories communicate so much to us about Christ, about God, about Christmas time. Part of my background is as a historian. I was a history major in college, so stories have tremendous meaning to me. And when I think of Christmas time and especially the beginning of Advent, I'm reminded of some real life historical stories that communicates so much about what Christmas has meant to others. When we hear the song, I'll Be Home for Christmas, that came out during World War II, we think about soldiers that were either trying to come home for Christmas or longing to come home for Christmas. I know at my grandparents' house, they had the Christmas party that was the family reunion, and it wasn't unusual during times of war to have some of our family members coming home with sea bags over their shoulders, still in uniform, fresh off the plane, coming into the house because they needed to be there for Christmas, that they, like, they did whatever they could to get leave to come home and be there. It was a time of coming together, but as soon as I got into the house, a sea bag got tucked into another room, the uniforms were off, and they were in their regular clothes and just sharing a time of Christmas together. Some of the other stories of history that tell us about the meaning of Christmas is the famous World War I Christmas truce of 1941, in which uh, soldiers uh, on both sides, the Allied side and the German side, uh, decided at Christmas time that there needed to be something more that they, remind, they were reminded of their own humanity and decided that they needed to have a time together. So it was sporadic at first, waving hands to make sure, or popping heads up just to make sure no one was still shooting, and then it grew into something more. The bands on both sides of the line started to play. Carols broke out and singing broke out, And then even in one instance, a soccer ball was brought out into the middle of the battlefield and soldiers joined together in a time of playing a game. This was the last time that that was going to be allowed during a time of warfare. But in that moment, the soldiers decided that a little bit of peace and a little bit of humanity needed to be present, that that was a part of who they were and that was a part of their understanding of what Christmas was all about. During the Civil War, there were also stories of Christmases in which the picket soldiers would trade rations across lines, that the bands of the regiments would start lifting up songs on both sides and sort of competing for who could play better Christmas songs. There was also stories of people uh, becoming like Santa Claus and bringing sleighs or wagons out into the middle of the battlefields on Christmas and giving out rations and supplies and first aid items uh, to soldiers during that time, just as a time of calm and a time of peace in the midst of all the horrendous things that were going on at that time, but just a reminder that God's peace was greater than the conflict that they were in the middle of. These real stories of historical Christmases are evidence of both God's spirit at work, but also the ability of the human spirit to choose God's peace, even in the midst of conflict. This is an important thing for us to remember and keep sight of, that we do have the ability to choose to choose peace, to choose who we are, to choose what it is that we believe to be good and true. We can choose God's peace. That's part of the gift of free will that we've been given. One of the greatest stories of choice that I could think of from Scripture is the king of Nineveh. If you remember the story of Jonah and the whale and everything else, one of the places that he did not want to go to was Nineveh, but he went. 
and he offered up a, a choice to the king, not expecting the king to choose it, but the king in that moment decided, okay. And he donned sackcloth and ashes, and he ordered the entire kingdom to do the same. Even the animals were to don sackcloth, ashes, and have a moment of time in which they submitted themselves to God, that they repented of their own sins, but submitted themselves to God and found forgiveness in that. The king could have chosen not to. The king could have chosen not to, but the king chose to do that. And it brought about the salvation of that kingdom from what had been in store. Choice is a powerful and amazing thing. We also can choose peace and equity among one another. Scripture often talks about valleys being made high and mountains being brought low. And it's a story of God establishing equity among people. Equity among cultures and societies. It's bringing those that are low up and bringing those that are high down and establishing common ground or equity among us, which also establishes peace together. Jesus, even in choosing his disciples, didn't choose all the same people. It wasn't like he went to the seashore and just got fishermen. He got fishermen, he got zealots, he got tax collectors, he even had men and women mixed together in his gathering and people that followed him. He wasn't just looking for commonality. He was looking for diversity. He was looking for all the different voices to come together and share in that mission and ministry that he was bringing forth. He knew that they could choose to find that common ground. We have been living in a time of division. But we can choose peace, and we could choose equity among one another. These are all examples of what we find in Christmas because they are also found in God's kingdom. They are found in God's kingdom, and we need to choose those. In our passages from today, from Isaiah, we are given a vision of God's kingdom on Mount Zion in which all will come to be taught by God the ways of God. Listen to the words of this again. It says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the temple of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What a vision this is of God's kingdom. What a vision this is of God's peace, where people come streaming to the mountainside, come streaming to the presence of God, that they take their weapons of war and they beat them into tools for providing, for food, for sustenance, for what is necessary for life. It's life-giving stuff. We get this message and we have that picture and that is the kingdom of God that we're constantly reaching for and striving for. In the message from Matthew, we're reminded that Christ will come again riding on a cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet call, right? And that we must be prepared. That we must be prepared. See, at Christmas time, we're not just celebrating a historic event. Christ lived, Christ died, Christ rose again. Christ was, Christ is, and Christ will be for all time, right? So we're looking forward to that kingdom that is present and future, that kingdom that we want now and that we will have in the future as well. But it's got to be something that we choose we choose. We keep waiting for it to be done for us, but God has already done it for us, right? What is he talking about? What is Matthew talking about in that passage? He's saying 
If you knew when the thief was coming, you would already prepare and make sure that the, that didn't happen, correct? So what are the things that we need to be doing and choosing so that we choose that peace that we want, that God desires for us, and make it a reality in our time? Because it's not going to be done necessarily for us because it already has been done for us. The example has been set. What we need to do is before us, we just need to choose it. See, both passages speak of being prepared for what God has in store. We need to live expectantly and intentionally as if Christ could return at any moment, at any moment. Maybe that's why Christ hasn't returned yet. In scripture, he talked about that before a generation would pass away, that he would return. But he didn't return then, and he hasn't returned yet. Maybe it's because God wants us to live within that expectation, to live into that understanding and that hope and that desire for Christ's return at any moment, as opposed to trying to pinpoint a specific time, just live as though Christ is with us now and realize that kingdom that is here already. So as we enter this Advent season in preparation for Christmas, what do we take away from these stories and these passages? What choices do we make, both individually and as a church? Christ's birth, God with us, a reminder of what it is to be, what is to be again, as we talked about before. So one of the things that we take away is this reminder that as we lead into Christmas, as we're coming into this season, to remember what this season has meant, not just for us and our own families, but for people throughout time. We hear stories of World War I, of the Civil War. We have stories going back even farther, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. We can go back to St. Nicholas and everything that was, was there for us that tell us about Christ Emmanuel, God with us, that they are reminders of not just what was, but what will be again. We need to remember this and bring that into our hearts and our understanding of Christmas and how we celebrate it together. We need to choose to create space in our family values and our family celebrations for equity and peace to reign above politics and stubbornness. I don't know about your families, and my hope is that holidays are a time of peace, but in my family of late, it's been a lot about politics and a lot about stubbornness, and that, that peace hasn't been there, but I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to instill that a little bit and make that be a part of it, and I think that's something that we all have to do. That, divisive, that division that I've been talking about is prevalent and real, not just in our families, but in our communities. How can we be reaching in and establishing that peace that God has in store for us in the midst of that, pushing aside the division and finding that unity in God's peace? The church can also choose to be an influence and evidence of God's peace on earth. We have examples of this in the stories that we've already shared, but we have things that we could find ways of doing, just like the people as Santa Claus coming out into the middle of battlefields and giving out things. What are some things like that that we may be able to do at Christmas time, both to feel that presence of peace of God, but also to share that presence of peace? Maybe on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, we remember some of our first responders in the area that don't get to have that day or that night off. <clears throat> we take a basket of food or take breakfast or take something to them to say thank you. We appreciate what you're doing as we heard the first responders even now a little bit ago heading off to a call. Maybe that's something that we could do. One of the things that happened for me when I was in the Coast Guard during boot camp, I was in boot camp over Thanksgiving and I could not go home. They did not give us leave to go and be with our families. However, some folks from the community adopted us and brought us home to their house and made us, made us family for that day. 
gave us phones to call. That was a rare privilege. <laughs> we actually got to call home. But they made place for us at their table with their family, and they fed us, and they provided for us, and they cared for us, and they loved us as if, they were, as if we were their own. I don't know if there's something we can do like that, but what if we did? What if we could? What if there's other people that just need a place at a table to be made welcome? What if we could do things like that? This church has heart and has spirit and has love abounding. We saw that with all the shoe boxes that were up here last week as gifts heading out into the world to bless a child. We saw that with the people that went to the Festival of Trees to decorate a tree to share a little bit of God's light uh, into the world and to make a difference for Kennedy Krieger. What if we found ways of sharing God's peace in powerful ways this Christmas time that reminded us of God's peace? What if we chose to do that, chose to make that a part of who we are and a part of the practice that we have at Christmas time? As we all enter into this season of Advent, let us soak in the spirit of Christmas that is evident and present in the sounds of carols and bells, in the sights of lights and decorations, the smells of pine, cinnamon, gingerbread, and sugar cookies, and the feelings of love, peace, hope, and joy spread by the church through God's spirit. Let us also be reminded that we not only celebrate a Christ child who came, but a Christ that is present and will come again. Choose to be prepared for Christ to return. Choose to live in God's peace above all else and choose God's peace above all else. Choose to keep Christmas well this year and always. And in the words of Tiny Tim, God bless us, everyone. Amen.